The year is 1955. Two brothers meet up in Egypt. They've been away from home for quite some time, and they've both been serving in different branches of the British Armed Forces. I want you to imagine what that must have felt like. Back in 1955, they didn't have the same ease of communication that we have today. So it was a long time since they'd heard from family or seen anybody they love. Somebody snapped a picture of that moment. Here they are. This is 1955, Terry and John in Egypt. That photograph and that story made it into the newspapers back home, where their family and friends could read all about them. That story is part of the mythology of my family. I grew up listening to it. Those two brothers are my uncles. We all have stories like this, stories that define us as family members, stories that define us as individuals. But more than that, we also have stories that we all share as a society. We have stories like films and television, historical events, even children's stories and fairy tales. Stories define society. And storytelling technologies change the world. Throughout history, we've invented lots of different ways to help us survive, from transportation and agriculture to weapons and clothing, lots of different kinds of survival technologies. But story technologies are different. They're not that. They don't really help us survive. So why do we keep trying to find new ways to tell each other stories? Today, I want to talk to you about some of the storytelling technologies that I see here in the present and some of the near future and further future storytelling technologies and how I think they might change the world. But in order to do that, I've really got to go back into the past, talk about some of the key story technologies from the past and how those changed how we interact with each other. So let's go back to that story of my uncles. Newspapers were made possible by writing and printing to the earliest storytelling technologies. Before that, stories were told verbally, face to face. And because of that, those stories were temporary. I grew up hearing that story, but will I tell that to my children someday? I have the newspaper story to refer back to, so people hundreds of years from now could still read that story. We have stories that have many different versions because they were told verbally. So fairy stories are a good example of this. For example, Cinderella. The story of Cinderella, as soon as I say that, you're probably thinking glass slipper, fairy godmother, pumpkin, um, maybe wicked stepsisters, right? But there are other versions of the story of Cinderella. There's one, instead of a, a fairy godmother, she has a magic cow. So why do we all share that version of Cinderella? Well, it's because it was written down. It was one of the earliest versions that was written down. So writing and printing fix stories in time. Writing makes stories easier to share, and then printing makes them easier to copy. It makes them more accessible. It makes them cheaper. It also makes them more permanent. So it's no coincidence that we have our best understanding of history really from about the 1400s on. And that's because that's when the printing press was invented. People started writing things down a lot more and sharing it more. And some of those things still exist today. But writing and printing both are inherently not real-time mediums. You have to write something down and then hand it off to somebody else to read. Even if it happened right there in that moment, it's still not real time. The next story technology I want to talk about is radio. So radio really changed that. Radio is a real time medium. For the first time, it allowed people to bring the voices of strangers into their homes. It's much more intimate. There was a a radio play in the 1930s, The War of the Worlds. Some people, reportedly, after listening to this radio play, 
really thought that aliens were invading New Jersey. Yeah, you're laughing because that seems really unrealistic today to be like, you heard that on the radio? But at the time, it's possible that some of the people really thought that because radio was so immediate and so central to their lives. The technologies that follow radio, film and television, add an additional dimension to that. So now you have the visual dimension to that real-time nature. We're very visual creatures, so we really connect with being able to watch people live out their stories in front of us. And in the early days in film and television, because it was hard to create visual effects, we thought of everything we saw on television as true. If you saw a news story, you would believe it because somebody filmed it. There's an inherent flaw with these, te these storytelling mediums, though. Film, television, and radio, they're all controlled by gatekeepers. What you see is curated by somebody else. And even today, it's very hard for people who are marginalized to get their stories told in this way, to make a film or to make a TV show. So that really changed with the advent of the internet and social media. Now, suddenly, we can share our stories with everybody. Millions of people. And I'm sure you've all heard that social media is gonna be the end of society as we know it, right? <laughs> but the truth is, every single one of these technologies, at some point in time, somebody said, this is gonna be the end of society. Even books, which seems a little crazy to hear about it, but every one of those technologies was heralded as the end of society, and it wasn't. The really interesting thing about the internet and social media is now it allows us to connect with people no matter who they are or where they are. No matter how isolated you feel, how niche your interests are, you can find somebody else somewhere in the world that shares them, that shares your experience of life. And that's really powerful. Of course, there is a downside to this, too. So with social media today, whether or not our stories are successful is really driven by algorithm. For the first time, instead of those gatekeepers, now our stories are mediated by code. I could tell you something that would make you very angry, very upset. And because those algorithms favor favor extra clicks, that story could easily go viral. But the key is, it doesn't have to be true. Really, the, what determines whether or not those stories are successful is really whether it aligns with your worldview. If you believe that that story could be true, you're more likely to share it. And conversely, if you believe that it's, it's not true, regardless of the facts, you're gonna call it fake news. So this leads to a, a situation where we have this negotiable truth, which can obviously have unintended consequences. So let's talk about the technologies that are here today now, the ones that are right on the cusp of becoming realities. So in 2015, Chris Milk and Gabo Aurora created a 360 degree film this film is called Clouds Over Cedra, and it's a seven minute long film in which they follow a 12 year old Syrian girl. She's a refugee in a camp. And what they found with this new medium is that when they showed it to people, they experienced a vast increase in donations to the United Nations refugee programs. People really felt like they were in that camp with Cedra. But even 360 degree film, as immersive as it is, is a passive medium. You're, you don't get a chance to move around inside that space and you can't interact with Cedra. You can't talk to her, you can't interact with her world. Virtual reality gaming, on the other hand, allows us to interact with the, those virtual worlds. But it also doesn't really easily allow us to tell stories about ourselves or the world that we live in. 
So those are the technologies that are here today, and they're really powerful. But in the future, I see even more powerful technologies coming. So the thing that I see closest on the horizon is called volumetric film. So instead of 360 degree film where you're limited to the camera's viewpoint, volumetric film uses either a special type of camera known as a depth camera, which captures both color and distance from the camera to create a full 3D capture of the world. Or it uses a different kind of setup using lots of traditional ca um, cameras. So this video shows you a, a volumetric capture stage. So this is the Intel Studio space in LA. They have green screen around so they can remove the background, but they're recording these actors and dancers from lots of different angles at once. And then once they put all of that footage together, they now have a real 3D world. So what that means is, as a viewer, you can put on a VR headset and go walk around inside that space. You can learn these dances from any angle. Or if you're viewing it from a 2D screen, you can spin around in space, just as you're seeing here. This is obviously a much more immersive medium than 360, but it's still passive. I, s I can walk around inside this space, but I can't interact with people. I can look at this from any angle, but I still don't have control over what happens. In the further future, what I see are digital humans. So imagine if you could capture yourself as you are today, in 2019, how you looked, how you sounded, what your mannerisms are, your personality and your memories. Imagine if you could capture all of that and then 10 or 20 years from now, be able to have a conversation with your younger self. What would that feel like? Or what about 200 years from now? What if somebody could come visit the world of here and today and have a conversation with you as if you were a real living digital human? These virtual worlds are just on the horizon. And so what do I think that that's going to do to society? You know, we've seen the impact of all these different technologies. How is a real virtual world that you can live within, how's that going to change what we do? Now, it's, it's possible that we could create worlds so immersive, so compelling, so perfectly designed for each and every one of us that we forget about the real world problems, problems we all share like climate change. But as I said before, all of these technologies have been heralded as the end of everything. But at the end of the day, what every single one of these story technologies has done is allow us to connect more with each other. They allow us to see the truth in each other's stories. Imagine if one day, instead of trying to walk a mile in someone else's shoes, you could actually do that. You could experience the world as they experience it, with them or even as them. <coughs> I've got to imagine that that kind of connection is going to be a really powerful thing. And I don't see a future where that's a bad thing. Thank you.